Welcome back to the channel. We've got a brand new episode of Home Course. Today we're in Hollywood, Los Angeles, California. We're meeting up with actor, producer, and world-renowned jeweler, Ben Baller. Ben burst onto the scene in the golf world in the last couple years. He's got quite the game. He's become a personal friend of mine. He's got a great pad here in California. We're gonna go check it out, go hit the course. So come along, let's go. When I'm not on the course hacking it up, making double, triple bogeys, or roasting professional golfers on the internet, I like to relax, put my feet in the sand, enjoy the sun, and throw down an ice cold Corona Premier. But unfortunately for me, even when I'm on the course, my feet tend to still be in the sand, in the bunker. My golf game might not be Premier, but my light beer is. Ben, what's happening, man? Dude. It's good to see you, man. Yeah, good to see you too, man. Thanks for having me over, man. Yeah, man, come on in. Dude, your place is incredible, man. This is sick. You know, <laughs> I, I, I wish it was the other house, you know what I mean? But I'm going through the middle of something right now, so this, this will make do for right now. Yeah, this is perfect, man. I love this. Yeah. Dude, right here, man. This is a big focal point here in the main area. Lots to talk about here. So it's funny, I used to have a crew in the 2000s in the, uh, in the MySpace days uh, called the Champagne Hooligans. And uh, I don't really drink much anymore now. As crazy it is, as much golf as I play, right? Like, uh, I drink tequila only, really. Yeah. But I was a big champagne guy. And I got so just engulfed in popping bottles. Like, it was just, a, it was part of my brand, you know? And then I stopped, but uh, I did a Moet campaign and like uh, they did a, a, the Nectar Imperial Rosé and they did these city attacks. That's why you see the LA on there, right? Yeah. And um, I have all these little cool little bottles, but like, you know, um, Andy Warhol edition, Jeff Koons, uh, Off-White, my boy from Ambush. And like, these were like iconic bottles, even like the Cause Hennessy. These are kind of like, I'm a collector, so I collect all kinds of random things. But Moet Hennessy is owned by LVMH, you know, parent brand, one of the yeah. biggest corporations in the world. And uh, I did this, if you know what a luminous is, it's the bottles at nighttime that light up. You push the button, the battery, so you light up, you know, the bottle girls like that. Scene, yeah. So to have a 101 Ben Baller Don Perignon champagne, it's like, who has that, right? Yeah, who has a 101? Not even Drake got one, you know what I mean? Sorry, Drake, <laughs> you're my dog, but, you know, so it's kind of cool. And you know, you think, um, the reason why I kind of kept it was like, when I shoot even par, I'm not gonna break that one open. That's gotta be like, you know, something crazy, but I'm gonna break out one of these joints because, you know, they're all. I was gonna ask you, what would it take for you to pop one of those open? I mean, that's. I don't know, man. Maybe, you know, my daughter, son's wedding. I don't know. That's a, that's a big one, you know? So I've been holding that for a minute. But yeah, you know, um, I'm not much of a, a, a super big drinker anymore, but, you know, I collect some of these things. It's actually, that thing weighs like 40 pounds. It's actually, you know, it's, it's, a, gero, it's a gero bomb. You can imagine. So yeah, it's like, what, six liters or nine liters, I forgot. They even have the 15, like the gigantic ones, but like, yeah, man, it was just part of a, you know, something, yeah. a little display. Dude, you've been in everywhere. You've been involved in so many things, your story, you know, we've got to meet over the last year through golf, Yeah. which, you know, we work in golf and you've just dived into golf world the last couple of years. And, you know, I tell everybody, you get hooked quick. I always joke <laughs> with people, I'm like, don't do it. You're gonna get hooked. It's a tough sport, it's humbling, it's challenging. But dude, you you jumped right into it. You broke 80 like super fast. You've already made a hole in one. Yeah. You won a pro-am playing with like world number one at the time. I mean, you've like climbed the top of the hill for most amateur golfers in such a short period of time. Yeah. That, you know, the haters are coming at you because oh, they're just bro. jealous, man. I mean, you've done a lot and it's, I mean, you just uh, stepped right into it. I know you got a golf coach and whatnot, but man. I mean, you know, I've got, the privilege to play with at least 25 tour pros. Yeah. And out of those 25, 80% of them are in the top 25 in the FedEx, you know, or the world ranking, whatever it may be, the best players in the world. Yeah. So having that touch and feel, if you ever watched The Last Dance, when Kobe first saw Jordan, 
He's like, oh. He talks about that. I think it was maybe uh, episode six of Last Dance. He goes, oh, now I get to finally touch and feel, see speed, see this. Now, of course, I'm new and, you know, I can shoot a 95 tomorrow, right, still. But, yeah. like, most people that I've come across, and I'm talking about guys who are really rich, been playing, have lessons, they're men, Bel Air Country Club, Hillcrest, whatever, all the top clubs. You know, these are guys who are six, seven handicap. They'll randomly message me. And these are guys who own $25 million homes, anything, whatever. And they're like, bro, I'm jealous. And I'm like, jealous because I played a prom? You could go pay for one. He's like, no, I'm jealous at your golf access. It's like, dude, you have your own clubs. Like you have this, it's crazy. Are you playing with Rom? Like I'm literally mind blown. The, when the PGA posted you with Tom Kim in Japan, I was like, dude, you have to be kidding me. Because yeah. I don't pay attention to any hip hop stuff. I pay attention to pretty much like bank trends and like wine, this and that. And one day I see the PGA post on Facebook Instagram and Twitter and it says, Tom Kim is the name, Ben Ball did the chain. <laughs> and it went all the way to create a family members. That's awesome. Watch, look at Facebook, they don't look at anything else. They see Facebook like, why is the PGA posting? And my mom's like, oh, Ben's playing golf now. It's like, he's 50 years old. He goes, <laughs> he just picked it up, yeah. When, when you know, pick, you know, play golf anytime. Yeah. yeah. And that's the unfortunate thing. My, um, I come from somewhat of a golf family a little bit. My mom played. My dad, uh, who raised me, um, he passed away uh, 13 years ago. I wish he was still alive. Yeah. And when he passed away, he gave me his pings. And these were like 5,000 hour clubs like 23 years ago. You know, they're the best of the best. And like, I just wish, you know, that would have been something nice. That's why I think I've kind of like, you know, been so adamant about my kids, my sons playing. Mm -hmm. You know, and like, and, and one of them's taken a liking, one of them's like, I don't like this, it's too hard, or this, and like, you know, but yeah, that's, I think in less than two years, I've definitely, I, I've moved up pretty fast in, in the golf world. Yeah. Well, I know you get your podcast studio in this room here with some some stuff with your music career. Yeah, so man, let's check it out. Check that out real quick. Check it out. All right, so you're a big time podcaster, got one of the top podcasts in the world. A lot of work goes into that, building it up, but... Your career in, in the music industry, producer, you work with some huge names. I mean, Dr. Dre, Master P, you got Ice Cube up here. I mean, Jay-Z. Jay-Z, I mean, yeah. the list goes on. But walk me through that time of your life and you know that industry. You know, um, it's funny, man. Um, Austin Reeves, I'm a huge diehard Laker fan, right? And uh, we played golf together and we were talking. He goes, you all know you used to be the man back in the day. And <laughs> we're talking and stuff. And um, it stemmed from, as a kid, I had this, you know, I just had a love for hip hop. And we're talking like late 70s, early 80s. I was, you know, late 70s, I was like four or five years old. Oh, I'm sorry. I'd have been seven, eight years old. Yeah. And I just took a, a love for Grandmaster Flash and Cold Crush and all this stuff. And the whole, every element of hip hop, that's DJing, MCing, graffiti, break dancing. And I became a pretty big break dancer at like 10 and like 11. Mm -hmm. My brother was taking me to these private underground clubs. My brother's a lot older than me. And he was taking me to clubs that were all ages and I was doing breakdance contests and I won some of these. Oh shit. So like in 1983, 82, they filmed this movie Breakin'. It was the first like big hip hop movie. And Ice-T was a big part of the movie. He was on the soundtrack. I met Ice-T. He became my unofficial like godfather. And me and Ice-T are super close to this day. And um, that led into me just wandering more into hip hop and stuff. So I learned how to DJ. Uh, a buddy of mine, Rob One, he was an LA DJ pioneer out here, rest in peace, he had passed away. Um, he had kind of helped two guys get their, de well, a lot of people, but I was one of them and another guy was a guy named Lior. Um, Lior ended up becoming a member of House of Pain. Okay. Huge fucking band, jump around, jump around. Yeah. You know? And then Lior, after House of Pain, he was in Limp Bizkit. So we're talking two gigantic groups, you know? And I was DJing, and the funny thing was, when I was in high school, you know, I got in trouble a lot, got arrested at a young age a couple times. I was kicked out of six schools in three years, two and a half years actually. And I didn't think, I don't know what was gonna happen. Breakdancing wasn't gonna necessarily, it, hip hop wasn't even popular until yeah. like, honestly, like maybe 10 years ago, right? When I say that, I mean like where it's nothing, you don't see anything but hip hop now. You know, in the 90s, it was big, but it was still like, erotic and taboo in a way. So um, I had to figure out a way coming from a, a, a dad who was a professor at UCLA, how do I, in the strict household of educations first, how am I gonna get into school? So I played football at a young age, played basketball. Um, I was all state, 
I was all, 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 um, all league, all CIF, and uh, you know, I had 11 touchdowns my junior year in high school, and I ended up getting a scholarship playing ball, D1. So um, that got me into school. Yeah. In fact, my senior year, I got kicked out before, and it wasn't like today where you can transfer schools like in the middle of the season. It's crazy what you can do now. It's nuts now, it's insane. NIL deals, all kinds of stuff. It was very strict. You couldn't even go to the same league if you had to transfer illegally, it was weird. So I moved schools um, and uh, was still able to, to play. Played ball and um, this is where it came with Austin Reeves. I realized you could be the man in high school and then you finally get into this big melting pot of all these other guys who were the men, right? You know what I mean? And I realized how not good I really was, you know, compared to like when, when 300 pound linemen are right behind me. Yeah. I'm like, bro, this is crazy. Now, genetically as an Asian, you know, I was what, I'm six feet, like 175 at the time. Um, I was fast, I was strong, but I was the second weakest guy on my team next to the kicker, right? I'll never <laughs> forget. But I started realizing that it wasn't gonna work. Yeah. But football was what I was good at, basketball was where my love is. So I transferred schools across the bay. I was at SF State, I played basketball, played football. I got to play and guard Steve Nash two times. No way. Like I played against some really big people through high school and stuff. So I had some great times playing yeah. that. But then I realized, is this really gonna happen? So I figured, I was like, you know what? Where basketball is today is nowhere near where it is, you know, back in oh, yeah. 92, 93. Yeah. So I said, you know what, I'm gonna go to Asia and try to play overseas. And it was funny, because I always, fig if you crack a door open, door can be closed too, no one's gonna open the door for me. You crack it up, I'm gonna bust that thing down, you know? And I always found some way, got really sick, this isn't gonna work, I was DJing kind of a little bit, house parties in high school, this and that. I was in college, I was really dialed in for, for sports, focused on that, loved music, but I knew I wasn't gonna play pro ball nowhere. Mm -hmm. So I came back to LA, met some people, started promoting at the world famous Roxbury, you know, like the, yeah. the Roxbury. And it was like every single celebrity in the world was there. Um, I ended up meeting Denzel Washington. He was opening a restaurant. I uh, met everyone there. I DJed uh, Jada Pinkett's like 22nd or 23rd birthday party there. That night, I became friends with Dr. Dre. I became friends with Tupac Shakur. Became friends with so many big wigs and ended up getting a job with Dre. From there, that pivoted me to meeting another guy named Brian Turner. If you watched the movie Straight Out of Compton, he was the executive at Priority Records. Kind of low key introduced him to his wife, who they're still together today. Like, wow. it's been, they've been married maybe 30 years or so. And like, it was a crazy thing. I started at the bottom, not the mail room, but the bottom of, of AR, which stands for Artists and Repertoire. The AR is person, the, the person who signs an artist grooms them, gets them ready, and then develops things, and then basically looks for the next act. So within two years or less, I became vice president of the record label. And that was a big deal, right? We had just signed Jay-Z. We did Jay-Z's first album, Reasonable Doubt. We had Ice Cube. We had uh, Master P, who was doing things that have never been done in the history of the world. He dropped an album every week, even during the holiday, it's like during the holidays, radio shuts down, everything shuts down. There was no internet streaming or nothing. So when the radio shuts down, there's no ads. Like you have 15 guys from every single record label with these records trying to get an ad, meaning trying to get it played on the radio, yeah. right? And like during the holidays, it's done. Master P didn't give a fuck. He was selling out of his trunk, he didn't care. He dropped 52 albums in one year. He had one album every week and he was charting, almost going gold on every album, sometimes platinum. So that was going on. There was a crazy beef going on with uh, Puffy, East Coast, West Coast stuff, and all these things that were going on. Yeah. Me and Pac became really cool. And so a lot of transition was happening. And um, I was working with Faith Evans, who was Biggie Small's wife. And she was in LA causing all kinds of trouble and everything, whatever, and Puffy wasn't happy about it. And so Faith was developing an R&B group that I had. Now this is a rap, gangster rap, pi they pioneered gangster rap at Priority Records. They never did R&B, never did soul singing, anything, it was a rap, like, yo, you know, like F this, F that, boom. Yeah. So I signed the first R&B group there, I was working with them. At the time, which is crazy, and that's why they call me the Forrest Gump of Hip Hop, I had two iconic people I was working with, one Faith Evans, who already had multi-platinum albums, and the girl who was the vocal coach wrote all my songs, did all the stuff with Missy Elliott. And Missy Elliott was broke, she wasn't anybody. She had not won 10 Grammy Awards, been one of the biggest hip hop rappers and everything. She changed the game. And she was working on Aaliyah's album, so like for her to take away and do this with me, we became really close. 
all this is going on, there's beef going on, and I decide, you know what? I got access to Faith. I'm with her all the time. My group's on tour with her as a backup singers. I asked Faith, I was like, look, do this song with them, boom. So I get Faith on a song, it's cleared. Meaning the label cleared, she cleared, Faith Evans cleared on it, whatever. So I have a track to do anything. So basically, I have a meeting with Tupac and he's shooting the movie Gang Related at the time. Mm -hmm. A buddy of mine who was Denzel Washington's partner named Brad Johnson, he owned a restaurant with them called Georgia and he also owned the restaurant where I met everybody at. And it was a bar as well. It was really, really high-end soul food and, and Jamaican food and all this crazy stuff. Brad's like, yo, I'm a producer on this movie. I'll get you with Pac. Cause at that time, remember there was no cell phone. There was cell phones, but it wasn't like you could just, yeah. you couldn't access anybody like you access them now. Yeah. So he's like, we're gonna be in Santa Monica and be here. I'm setting it up. So I'm gonna get Tupac to be on the song with Faith in the heat of this crazy beef between Biggie and all this stuff, whatever, and all these crazy things are going on. I already had the clearance. So this is gonna be crazy. I had Biggie's wife and Tupac it's on the song time. together. Yeah, it was nuts. And so um, I'm chilling. I'm at a tattoo shop called Tattoo Mania on Sunset Boulevard. I find out Tupac got shot. So I'm like, oh my God. I had an artist named Gonzo at the time, rest in peace. This is such a crazy thing to think of these people dying. But I hit Gonzo up and I was like, let's go to Vegas. Let's go see him. So I didn't get a chance to get out there. And the day of our meeting, was the next Friday. He got shot on a Friday night after the Mike Tyson fight. That Friday, one week from then, that was the meeting I had in Santa Monica with Pac to get on the song. And at that point, um, uh, Pac had died. So I was like, damn, man, this sucks. Jeez. I end up re-signing my new contract at Priority. Um, it's the most money I ever made. It's like 120 grand salary, which was really big for me. I was 23 at the time. You were 23 yeah. during all this time? Yeah, doing all this, right, it's huge. So, I signed his contract, Dr. Dre hits me. He's like, hits, hits me up with his, his right-hand man named Bruce Williams, and, and he goes, hey, I'm about to start this record label called Black Market Records. I'm like, and I'm thinking, he knows Brian Turner, because Brian signed him, the NWA, right? This is the guy that signed the group. So I was like, dog, I just signed a contract with this record label, and I just signed it like days ago, and he goes, okay. So you got a lot of thinking to do. So I'm walking around the office, not doing any work, close my office door and I'm talking to people, started talking to some people inside I trust. And I was like, damn. So now I ruined a relationship with the guy who gave me a huge chance, gave me an office, gave me a thing, boom. But I went with my dream. I was like, dude, this is my, this is Dr. Dre. It's Dr. Dre. I mean. Yeah. So I left, went there. He couldn't get the name Black Market Records. Someone in Sacramento had owned the name. They wouldn't release it or sell it. So we started Aftermath Entertainment. And then from there, you know, for a year or two, we didn't twiddle our thumbs. We produced a lot of music. We had like eight artists signed to the label. It was a slow start. And then the firm, we did that in Miami, which was Nas, Foxy, Brown, and AZ. Did that album, started gaining some things. Phone Tap just came out. It was a big hit throughout the hip hop community. And then Dre's like, yo, I'm gonna check out this dude at this freestyle contest. And I was like, who? He goes, he's a white boy. And I was like, <laughs> All right, bro, you know, you're, you're, you're kind of like, you're not as, you're, you're more hip than I think. Okay, cool, yeah, you know, you're the, you're, you're, you're the boss. You're, yeah. you're, the, you're, the, you're like the real master. You take his word for it, yeah. So I'm like, his name's Eminem? And I was like, okay, so I'm thinking like Eminem, like the Eminem's candy. Yeah. And I'm like, and he spells his name like this? He's from Detroit? Like, I was like, all right, cool. Eminem, he had signed. History. 50 Cent, Game, everything, Kendrick Lamar, like it just became a different thing. And so, you know, did the Up and Smoke tour, Chronic 2001 drop, I, I'm Dark Trade 2001. I was a DJ for his artist named Hitman, who wrote like 70% of that 2001 album. Um, and it was just an amazing time. Now I'm getting into golf and I'm thinking, can I do this with golf? And oh, we talked about it earlier, you're off to a hot start, man. Yeah. We'll do some incredible stuff. Yeah. So it's been like, you know, I don't know anybody who has two successful, successful careers. Yeah. actual careers I have had three right and well I don't know as an amateur but you know I, I, I have already I want to change the landscape for golf I hate when people say of course they say I used to say it but they say grow the game grow the game yeah I've grown the game okay out of my almost three million followers across all my social platforms 75% or more of them don't even care about golf they're buying my clubs they're buying things they're buying stuff I, I, I'm growing the game yeah. you know I just want to change the landscape of how people look at it because it's one of the biggest, funnest, 
low-key recreational sports. Of course, you can't just go out to any playground and play, you know, you play basketball, you can play soccer or whatever, but it's hard to just play golf because it's expensive, clubs and everything. Yeah. But I'm gonna have people try at least. Yeah. You know, and I think that's where it's valuable. All right, man, so obviously you've done some incredible stuff. Golf space. First time really I like interacted with you and, and saw you in the golf space was actually at Torrey Pines. So I'm walking with right. Jay Day and Reggie Bush. Oh, Reggie's my boy, yeah. They're playing pretty good in the yeah. Pro-Am. They had Stan from ESPN playing with them. Oh, Stan's my boy. Yeah, they, they thought they won the Pro-Am. Yeah. And so we're coming into the end and then I see my boy Rom and Ben Baller <laughs> posting this trophy winning at Torrey Pines and they're like what like how did like they had no clue that they lost so it was like all right here we go and then I just started following along obviously you were doing some stuff with with Steven and JR and then I just saw you just hooked on golf always playing oh just God. doing your thing and stuff and so you have some pretty cool accolades and accomplishments that you've been able to pull off in the golf space like we said early on but you've got some of your uh, your hardware here these are some of the courses that you've so yeah, play, play. These, are, these are, I collect any course that I've played. Um, you know, it was funny cause, and I don't care about whatever, but the day of the, uh, of the US Open Pro-Am mm -hmm. was my actual divorce court date. And my divorce attorney knows how much I love golf. And yeah. she's like, all right, we could postpone this. I was like, no, 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 no. We need to get this over with. So whatever, I still got to go to the US Open and you know, check out that. Um, when I got uh, uh, my G-Wagon, Mercedes-Benz gave me uh, Mercedes-Benz Pro V1s. This was my first Ben Baller tailor-made ball. Um, I did a collab with Bathing Ape, so they started doing some golf stuff. I did a thing with, with Murakami and tailor-made. Um, the Kingdom, obviously the training center, yeah. but like Riviera, the George Lopez tournaments, Augusta, um, Bel Air Country Club, Lakeside, Wynn, uh, TPC Los Colinas, TPC uh, Harding Park, and just random courses. Everything's mostly on the West Coast. I've yeah. played some stuff in Florida, but like I played the Zozo Champ Pro-Am in Japan. So like, yeah, you know, I kept that. And uh, I even have my own gold Ben Baller ball that we also did. And by the way, they're going for like crazy money. <laughs> it's like crazy stuff. Um, here, gets interesting. I don't want to deep too deep into it, but during the pandemic, when everyone's money was frozen as far as my, you know, my agency is a sports agency. Mm -hmm. And I was the second signing that wasn't a pro athlete. You know, I signed a deal with Tops. I did a three year deal with them. I ended up doing $23 million in baseball card sales with my Ben Baller logo on them. Wow. Total, right? So this was my first rookie card. So it's a Ben Baller actual official tops rookie card. This was actually real re registered with the whole baseball card, you know, system. Um, this is PSA 10 and it's pretty surreal to have my own card with, you know, Ben Baller. And I'm wearing the Snickers chain. I don't know if they got this picture of it, but it must've been <laughs> at the NFL words. But yeah, um, going down uh, this list, uh, my first hole in one, um, wedding You still just have the one right now, right? Yeah, just okay. one. I've come close twice. Okay. Like, but the closest is like eight, you know, eight inches. So it's like, you know, it's not like yeah. at the, you know, at the, the thing. Um, first hole in one, uh, I'll never forget. It was a Saturday. It was like between 6.15, 6.30. Um, I had been, my first actual round of golf was like May 2nd, 2022. So this was July. So I'm literally a couple months in. Jeez. And uh, I've never teed a ball up high. I was always told to tee, if it's iron or a wedge, mm -hmm. you know, if you talk, tee up low, right? So it's kind of to the ground just to help you a little bit. I teed up my 56 wedge like this high. Wow, okay. And I was like, all right. I was like, bro, I've never, I've never no practice that. swing. And I went and I hit it and it wasn't thin at all. I caught it, it went up 70, 80 feet in the air. And it's kind of like a little thing. I see it land 10 feet behind the pin, spins back and it's rolling, but it's not rolling slow. Let's say it's got probably a hell of spin it's, on it's, that. It's shot. got spin on it and it's rolling. And I'm like, <laughs> my God, dropped my club, went crazy, started screaming. I went crazy. I didn't tell anybody, didn't tell no one. I call my coach, I'm calling my, I call everybody. I'm calling, no one's picking up the phone. So I'm like, oh my God. I ended up and finishing the by round. Yourself on the, on the course? By myself. There were some kids on hole eight, I'm on hole three, and they heard me scream, so they thought that I was getting, I was gonna get, I was getting robbed or something because there's been like crazy robberies going on. <laughs> so I ended up finishing the round one under par. It's a par three course, whatever. But I ended up having some amazing shots that I was just like, wow, this is insane. No one's gonna bleed me. Mm -hmm. 
So I told my coach later on the night, and my coach is really big on like, you know, I'm like, oh, I broke eight today. He goes, no, you didn't. I was like, what do you mean? He goes, you, you dropped one in the water, you took a second shot here. And I was like, no, he goes, no, those are mulligans. I was like, what the fuck is a mulligan, right? I didn't understand. And he was really like that, you know, like, hey, you can drop here, you can do this. He was teaching me all the USGA rules of certain things. So he's like getting a temperature check. He's like, I don't know if you know, but they have really old cameras there. Like the white, you know, long, like old cameras. I'm like, bro, hole three between 6.15 and probably 6.25. Bro, no please pull it up. The next day, he's like, bro, dude, you really did it. I thought you were lying. Just, and look, golf makes good people do really bad things. It does. Lie, do this, and I was like, wow, okay. On Monday morning, when I went to go see my lesson, they come out with a certificate, hole in one, boom, I have a certificate, and it, it, was, it was insane, and it was great, it was, it was nuts. Um, my first eagle at Live, my first birdie at Lakeside. Um, I was, there, I was there with you in that, that eagle too. I, I got the, the, the drive recorded, piped it past <laughs> Brian Urlacher. But uh, on my 50th birthday, my team decided to make me, and this thing gonna come out, a solid gold golf ball. Saw, oh my gosh. <laughs> Dude, what a team, man, what a gift. Right? Dude, this is incredible. And uh, your you know, um, logo there. It's, it says 50 on the back, happy 50th. It was my 50th birthday, and, and the funny thing was, no one gets me anything for Christmas or birthday. Like the dads don't get, like I, I don't need anything, right? Yeah. Like what are you gonna get me? Honestly, that, there's not even clubs that I want. I have everything I want. Yeah. When I saw this, I was like, yo. And he goes, for your that's... 60th, we're gonna ice it out. And I'm like, all right, man, <laughs> you know. Yeah, that's a really cool special gift. That's something that you're not gonna go get yourself. But yeah, no, uh, uh, I played, uh, you know, with uh, Zozo and Colin Morikawa had signed that, you know, cause we're on TaylorMade. Um, and uh, that's a classic this. right there. This is really old. And the funny thing was, I got this way before I even played golf. I was just like, no, I always knew Tiger, of course. But yeah, yeah. That was that, obviously my, my, my Pro-Am championship uh, um, trophy. The funny thing was, Rom said one, he said a lot of things. We talked the whole round, right? But he said, hey, don't look at the Jumbotron. And I was like, Jumbotron, what are you talking about? And he goes, you don't see that 70 foot gigantic thing. He goes, and I was like, they don't have our names on there. He goes, of course they do. This is, a, you know, they're there. And I was like, he's like, don't look at it. Don't look at it at all. Now, the funny part was when we went from hole nine to hole 10, Gareth Bale went to the bathroom. So I was like, oh shit, okay. I thought it was like the turn, right? Yeah. Tokyo is totally different than this already, right? Tokyo was like straight up, you're playing for your, you're playing your ball. There's no like, there's no, there's a group of you're playing your ball. It is straight up stroke play. I went to the pro shop. I was gonna get a chicken sandwich here and there. My cat is yelling, like, what are you doing? Or whatever. So I remember going to hole 10 and I was like, no, no, I'm all good, I'm all good, I'm all good. And I just hit the ball as fast as I could. And I was like, it went like, you know, it was in play, but. It was funny because Rom said, don't look at the score. Don't look at the, the, the thing. I didn't know we were, we were doing so well. Yeah. So like the other people, it's funny you say that. I didn't know because me and Reggie were talking. I didn't know. But when, when they announced my name, I had barbecue sauce on my cheek. <laughs> I had, I had, and, and the thing was the caddy and all that took my clubs, but I kept my wedge towel. The one that I was cleaning the irons was dirty. I was so hungry from not eating anything because I have stomach issues and I didn't eat anything. And I was so nervous all day. I was eating crazy. And I was like, baller wrong. I was like, no. <laughs> No, I lost my mind, you know? So that trophy means everything to me. That is awesome. I have to do it with the John Rahm too, that's awesome. I feel how heavy this is, dude. <laughs> <laughs> it's like 40 pounds, yeah, right? It's insane. So this is my next drop. Nobody has seen this yet. This is my Ben Baller gold poker set. This, I'm struggling holding this thing. It's heavy. Um, you know, gold, big blind, small blind, dealer chips, uh, heavy dice. You no, know, we got five dollars, fifty dollars, hundred dollar chips and feel. You know the chips are hot. You know sets just like solid. Just the and, weight and all this. Yeah, and even down to uh, here, hold this yeah, real quick. I don't want you to drop it, man. It's the only one right now. Um, you know we went all out. I wanted this to look the part. Wow. You know, oh sorry. So yeah, we got Ben Baller, gold playing cards. These are done. Look, I want to do matted gold wow. with a little bit of shine on them. And it was just awesome. They come with a certificate. Golf's always going to be there uh, and, and, and I'm excited. And it's something that I could do with my kids. I could play basketball with them, but it's different. Again, like you said, you're breathing fresh air, you're on the course. There's nothing like that. Yeah. Well, speaking of that, man, this has been incredible to come through here and see this and you know, share all these <laughs> stories, but let's head to the course, let's go, go hit some shots. Let's go, then, man. I'm a little rusty, but share. let's do it. Let's do it.
All right, man, made it out to the course. Got that beautiful pink Bubba driver out here. <laughs> yeah. Love that, man. I saw you posted that he sent you out one of those, but first time I've really seen it in person, it's clean. Yeah. It's got the Bubba smoke, Bubba smoke hazardous uh, shaft. You know, it's crazy because uh, he's lefty and uh, they did the retail ones like five, six, seven years ago. Uh -huh. So this was never for retail. And I guess he had some right-handed ones made for friends and family. Yeah. But I love this thing, dude. Yeah, it's dope, man. Well, dude, we're out here, so we'll walk us through this. So this looks like a it's pretty short par four. Yeah, this is a dryable, not for me, maybe for him, for Travis. This is a dryable par four. It's a 276 yards. Pin is a little back. But yeah, if I could just get it like right, you know, 40 yards short, 50 yards short, we're good. I had a little chip shot. Yeah, it starts off some birdies, man. Show us the way. Here we go, right down the middle. Look at that, bro. There we go, holding the pose and everything. Look at that. All right, we'll pop up. You're in, you're in play though, hold on. Oh, you're in play. Oh, you got a nice little kick. Dude, so you just got into golf. I know that golf's been like part of your family and stuff like that, and you've been around it in some ways, but what was like the moment when you like were on the course, you're like, man, I, this is it, I, I'm hooked. Like, was it a shot? Was it just a round? You know, what's funny is I broke 100 pretty quick and it was here on this course and I had a really, really good shot um, on the next hole. I stuck it like four feet and I was like, bro, this game is amazing. Next hole, terrible. Then the hole after that, it was pretty good. And I was like, I see what this is doing. Yeah. And it was just, again, and I started realizing there's certain things, you know, again, uh, obviously the strategy, right? Like if you go out there and really, like let's say for instance, um, if you're a scratch golfer, right? You're not trying to shoot every single hole as a birdie. If you're trying to just stay away from bogeys and try to go par, maybe one bogey here and there. I, I just didn't think about it. You're like, all right, listen, I'm gonna go for it here, go for it here. You just have to realize like on my best rounds, I realized were obviously the, the rounds where I didn't go, I knew when to take the bogey and not go for it. I knew when I could do certain things. I knew, okay, look at great. This is a hole I can mess with. I might not be able to get on in three on this par five, but I'm gonna get the up and down. And the same thing, and I just started doing that and I just started realizing, you know, giving myself more par looks, more birdie looks, and just being more focused on those type of things. Once I started understanding scoring strategy-wise, it was more than just hitting it straight. Because you hit it perfect and be like, oh yeah, I hit it with for the pin. I didn't understand that you don't always want to go for the pin. Right? So, you know. So like right now, obviously, I'm hoping I go right of the pin, but we'll see what happens. You know, I can't really. All right, so that's your plan. A little right of the flag? Yeah. Oh, went a little left of the flag, but the distance is there. Okay, on the green, on the green. Little birdie look right there? Yeah, man. little birdie look. 